Now, I know I sound like a frog this morning, but uh, this message that I want to give, if you remember last week, I said I had two resurrection messages, and I didn't know which way to go. Well, <clears throat> last week we covered 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, but I had developed this through the years, and I've given it many times at the faith home. Uh, and it's what we're going to do this morning is we're going to follow the life of Peter as he interacts with the Lord, and it's going to give us great hope because Peter was, I think, like a lot of us. He wanted to do so good, but he fell. He had determined that he was going to be there for Christ at Christ's most needed moment, but he wasn't. But the Lord redeems. So the story of the table and of Peter is one of forgiveness of restoration, of power, and of hope. That's what we all live, really, if we admit to it. You heard it in the song we played, We Are Not Alone. If there's one glorious truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that you and I are not alone. We're never alone. Now, you can say, well, David, I know that. I'm, I'm a semi-theologian. I know about the omnipresence of God. I'm not talking about the omnipresence of God. I'm talking about Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we're going to see that again in Peter's life and how it just lays before us our absolute need of the Spirit of God to work in and through us. We have no hope without Christ in us. If you remember last week, we looked at Paul's words when he was trying to <clears throat> combat the heresy of there's no resurrection. And he said, if there's no resurrection then this is all a farce. There's no gospel. There's no forgiveness of sins. If Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, then we are most everyone to be pitied. But we know the great news is he has done that. So, let's begin our journey. Let's look at the life of Peter. <clears throat> And I'm going to start by giving you Peter at the end of his life, as the Lord inspired him to write this in his epistle. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There it is. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, now we begin. We back up. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, I love the way the chosen has betrayed the life of Christ and the life of his disciples. And I even love the way they portrayed Matthew. You know, he's kind of, he's got his little fingers going and he's careful to write down everything. But you see the way he put this almost in a simple yet strong verse. They immediately left their nets and followed him. 
that we know, not just from the chosen, but from other uh, extra biblical and biblical writings, that these, even though they were fishermen, they were Jewish. So they were raised with the teaching about Israel and the history and the coming Messiah. So immediately they left their nets and followed him. But that, you talk about a step of faith, this is your livelihood. And I think they just pulled their nets in and followed Jesus, the rabbi. Good beginning. We could say our initial faith in Christ was a great beginning. We were born again. And then in Matthew, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he questioned his disciples. Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And those, that's pretty good company. But not when you're the Lord of glory. <laughs> but what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. You could say, Again, in that wonderful mystery of the Trinity, you could say that Jesus saw the genius of the Father's plan to not only have it as uh, in Ezekiel, it says, hey, listen, you used to follow, you, you follow by commandments that are written in stone, but there is coming a day when I will write my laws on your heart. I'm going to put my spirit within you. There's going to be a change in your heart. That was the promise of Ezekiel, of the new covenant. And I believe right at this moment, Jesus began to see that being fleshed out in Peter. And I tell you that you, Peter, are on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Peter's proclamation about Christ, it was victory through God's revelation. You could say, <clears throat> in many ways, it was a high point for Peter. When the Lord looks at you and says, blessed are you, because the Father has revealed this to you, that was a great, not only encouragement, but uh, affirmation for Peter a lowly fisherman. Careful, Peter. This is in Matthew, uh, let me go back here. Matthew 16. Something's about to happen that illustrates the scripture, be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. Oh yeah, this, I've got it here. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Matthew 16. This is later in this chapter. This is in the same conversation as that great proclamation of Peter and in acclamation of Jesus that 
the father had done something special in his life to give him that revelation. Peter took him aside because what Jesus followed up with, well, I must go to Jerusalem and die. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Was he filling his oats from the acclamation? <laughs> Rebuking the rabbi? Far be it from you, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Phew. You're a stumbling block to me. For you do not have them uh, in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Your proclamation will be what I build the church on. Get thee behind me, Satan. Oops. <laughs> it's just startling to me. And you're, it's going to get even better. Then Jesus said to them, this night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus had done that every time he talked about his death. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. And there's that power, that promise, that hope of the resurrection. And <clears throat> Peter said to him, if, any fall, if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, declared Jesus declared, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter replied, even if I have to die for you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. Part of what I have loved about the chosen, and sometimes it gets a little exasperating because you want to see another miracle, you know, is there behind the scenes of the Pharisees and that dead religion that they had grabbed a hold of. Remember how Jesus reserved his harshest criticism for the Pharisees. They were the ones that could bowl you over with their prayer. But Jesus said, you pray on the street corners. You pray many words. There was one place where he said, you go to make a disciple of, of yours and you make him as twice as much the son of hell as you are. <laughs> you shouldn't say that to religious leaders. All of them said, we're with Peter, we'll never deny you. Hey, I know each of us, because I know all of you, have had a time in your life when you've, not time, maybe times where you've said to the Lord, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. I, I love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want to follow you. Maybe we've gone so far as I will never deny you, even if it's death. I heard of a church, um, and this was back in the 70s and 80s when, you know, uh, everybody was thinking that Jesus had already pulled back the curtain and he was fixing to step out. <laughs> so I guess they were trying to get all the Christians ready, and so this church staged having uh, armed guards come in to the church and say, we're going to take you out one by one, and you'll need to confess if you are a Christian or not. And if you are, you will be shot. I thought that was a little extreme, even for that time. They were trying to illustrate a point, I guess. But gee, uh, Peter, Peter gladly, I mean strongly, boastfully said, I will never deny you. There's another, uh, you know, the gospels. There was another gospel where it said, 
Peter, I could see him kind of go, Lord, I don't know about these other guys, <laughs> especially James and John, you know, because there was that rivalry. But I'm with you all the way. But here it says that all the other disciples said the same thing. We're with you, Lord, no matter what. I had to put it in here because I want it. I hope you can write down references, but I had to put this in here. And uh, that's Matthew. I've got the, it's supposed to be Matthew, I think, 26. Anyway, meanwhile, Peter was sitting in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him. You're also were with Jesus, the Galilean, she said. But he denied it before them all. I do not know what you're talking about. I've read about the construction of this area where the Sanhedrin met. And it was like a lot of the construction of temples and other buildings. They, they had kind of like a breezeway. You know, down in Charleston, they have that wonderful side porch to try to catch the wind. Well, they had this breezeway. It was held up by columns. And so in the outer courtyard, you could see inside where they were meeting. And uh, so Peter's out here, though. I guess it was chilly that night, and he was warming himself. But he could see in there where they were. And one of the uh, servant girls said, yes, you are. You're one of his disciples. First denial. When Peter had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. He wanted to be stronger this time. I do not know the man. After a little while, standing nearby, maybe uh, because he thought he had said it loud enough and had an oath so everybody would leave him alone. Those standing nearby came up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. <clears throat> they said, your accent gives you away. And at that, he began to curse and swear to them, I do not know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Lord, I'll follow you to death. No, Peter, you're going to die me three times before the rooster crows. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Bitterly. We've all made vows to the Lord. We've all uh, committed things to the Lord. And if we try to do them in our own strength, we're probably going to end up like Peter. We've all wept bitterly to find that we've messed up again. But thanks be to God, we have a Savior. We have a Lord. We have a God, as it says even in the Psalms, who is mindful that we are dust. And as a father pities his smaller children, God pities us. He knows us. He knows our frame is weak. But then the cross. After the trial, the cross, the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, mercy and forgiveness. And I couldn't put all that, you know, we'd be, well, I'd have a thousand slides if I tried to do this. So turn to John chapter 21. I've gone over this and other messages. 
but I've gone over in uh, other messages, but it fits in here because we're tracing Peter and because I love what Jesus did. First of all, uh, well, let's just read the whole chapter. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, <clears throat> the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, two others of the disciples were together. This is after the resurrection. This is after they'd seen him several times. Something had to have been communicated to Simon. You'll see what I mean. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. <laughs> it's like, okay, the Great Commission hadn't been given. <laughs> what do we do now? We're excited that Jesus is alive, but all I know how to do is fish. Let's go fish. They said to him, we are going with you also. Peter was a leader, I guess. Just went out and immediately got in the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered, no. And he said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You know what Jesus was doing? First of all, when you say, well, why didn't they know it was Jesus? He had appeared to them after the resurrection. Well, you ever been out in the early morning light? There's a haze that's there. And, you, you know, it's not totally, the sun's not totally up, so there's just this haze, a kind of a grayness to the world. Turkey hunting, you can see that. You're in the woods and you're waiting for it to get light and there's just this haze. Well, and they were out in the boat, no telling how far. They just didn't recognize that this was Jesus. But Jesus, because, and listen to me, because he loved them and because he knew what he had done in their lives and the time that he called them to himself. And guess what? He knows you and I the same way. He knows what to speak to our hearts that will make a familiar sound to us. And so he does this, this miracle that was really uh, the, one of the ways he confirmed in them early on that he was God. Verse 7, Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put his on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. Now wait a minute, guys. I got a question before the house. If you had denied the Lord three times in his most crucial hour and it so broke you that you were, went out and wept bitterly and now you, it's been confirmed that there's Jesus on the shore, I don't know about you, but I would be hiding in the back of the boat. Guilt, shame. Not Peter. Something Jesus had communicated to Peter, we, it's not recorded in those appearances. Peter, you and I are solid. We're okay. I love you. Because Peter jumped into the boat. Uh, you, John, what you think John tried to do in his humanness, we talked about the Scripture being fully human and fully, fully divine, you think John was trying to let all the, for, for history, when the Bible goes down through history, I want you to know how impulsive this crazy Peter was. He's the first one to run in 
After the resurrection, I was polite. I stood at the door, not Peter. He bolted right in. And now he's jumping in the water. Ridiculous. I'm going to tell you, it's not ridiculous. When you know the Lord has forgiven you. That worst moment in your life, that denial, it's not ridiculous. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net of fish with them. They were going to have a big breakfast. They didn't think they were going to eat anything. Now they're going to have a big breakfast. Then, as soon as they came to land and they saw the fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Well, they're bringing fish in. Where did Jesus get the fish? Well, he got a coin out of a fish's mouth one time. I think he could catch some fish. I think he could summon some fish. I bet you his fish tasted better than all the other fish they ate that day. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish which you've just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And all there, there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. I stand at the door and knock. If any person will open that door, I will come in to his home, her home, her heart, his heart, and I will sup with him. We'll have fellowship together. Then he said, uh, just by way of a side, no one asked if it was the Lord. Once we got close enough, we knew it was the Lord. And of course, the the, the 153 fish testified it was the Lord. Now, this was the third time Jesus had shown himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, I've made this observation. I went back and checked it to make sure I was right because I I did hear hear it in another message. The first two times that Jesus asked the question of Peter, do you love me? He uses the verb in the Greek, do you agape me? Meaning, are you fully on board? And Both times Peter answered, Lord, you know I phileo you. You think you'd been humble a little bit? I don't care what anybody else does. I will die for you. Lord, you know I love you. And so the third time, and listen to this, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you phileo me? And I think a very relieved Peter went, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. That speaks to me that wherever you are in your walk with the Lord this morning, he will meet you there. If you're not at agape yet, that's where he wants to get you to. But he'll meet you there. And by his wonderful spirit, you will say one day, Lord, you know I agape you. You know I love you with all my heart. So, 
maybe to drive it home. He says, Moses, surely I say to you, when you were younger, <clears throat> he's talking about Peter, you girded yourself and walked as you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And John adds the commentary, this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And, he, we, and when he had spoken this, he said, follow me, like that first day. Three times, don't know the man. Three times, Lord, yes, I love you. I love our God, don't you? I love the mercy of God. I love the forgiveness of God. I love the compassion of our God. And he did it for that fiery, confident Peter. So, let's go on. Nevertheless, Jesus says this, nevertheless, I tell you, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus realized that they needed the Holy Spirit. He knew it. And he said, it would be to your advantage to go, wait. Now, you know when the disciples first heard this, they went, wait a minute, wait a minute. When 5,000 people were hungry, you took two fish, three loaves of bread, and we have 12 baskets left over. When we didn't have a catch didn't know where the fish were. You told us to throw it on the other side of the boat. I don't know if you remember, Peter said, at your bidding, we'll do it. One of the gospels said. You knew where the fish were. We pull up lame, we saw you heal lame people. If we're struck with blindness, we saw you heal blind people. We saw you <clears throat> raise the three did, James, Peter, James, and John, we saw you raise Jairus' daughter. We saw you raise a Lazarus. We see you as a resurrected man, the dead man walking. <laughs> How can it be to our advantage that someone like you, and your words, we're not even talking about how they burn in our hearts when we hear the authority for which you speak. They didn't know, did they? But Jesus knew. And he said, it's to your advantage. Why? Because, and again, I, I can't help but sometimes refer to the chosen, because, but it's in there. Uh, they said Jesus would just go off to pray with the Father all night. I could hear him say, you think he's going to come back? <laughs> I hope he does. What will we do if he doesn't? And while they were gathered together, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that the Father has promised, which you have heard me discuss. For John baptized with water, but a few days, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But, it, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. If you're worried about not being a good, uh, well, I'll use the old term that everybody liked to beat us, a soul winner. You don't win, you don't win anybody. Jesus does that. But Jesus said, when we receive God himself through the Holy Spirit in our lives, we will be witnesses. And a witness simply says, I'm ready to tell anybody what Jesus has done for me and what he could do for them. You don't have to make it complicated. How many evangelism seminars have you gone to in your life? And I remember at the church I grew up in, we had one, and boy, I thought it was big time. I was down in the basement. We weren't even meeting in the sanctuary. This was training. And man, I, you know, I'm ready. 
But then they said, now Thursday night after we've learned this little, it was a train thing they had, we're going to go out and knock on doors and witness. And I remember everybody went, you can see them looking around like, oh no. You know. But now, I don't know about you, but I intentionally look for a single crack in the door that I can say, well, you know, can I tell you about Jesus and what he's done for me. I've told you about Sandy Adams mentioning uh, before a prayer when a waitress or waiter comes up and he'll say, you know, Dave, he calls me Dave. I think I finally broken him. I think he's going to call me David from now on. We're, big, we're believers and we're about to pray before our meal. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And boy, the first time I heard that because of the way things happened with Sandy, I thought, nobody will turn down prayer. I was wrong. There'll be some people, nah, I'm good. Okay. (laughs) You know. But we've had times. We were out in California when this waitress came up and he said that, is there anything we can pray for you? And tears started running down her cheeks. And my mom and dad are getting a divorce. My heart's breaking. Will you pray for me? Came back to fill up our drinks. Can I ask you to pray for one more thing? <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. And you know, it was so sweet. She said, my mom's moved in with me. She doesn't like dogs. I've had this dog as a pet for years, and she wants me to get rid of him, and it's breaking my heart. We'll pray for you. Looking for ways just to mention the name of Jesus. Why? Because as you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be witnesses for Christ. Now quickly, Peter's transformation, our hope of transformation, the indwelling Spirit. Peter and John were at the gate, beautiful, if you remember, at the temple, going to pray, and they, they came up upon a lame man. And Peter said to him, I love the way Peter did, silver and gold we don't have. And I, I bet to that guy, I said, well, what in the world are you talking to me for? You know I'm here. But what we have we'll give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And when he got up, and the, again, the chosen does a great job of this with the man at the pool. Man, he starts, he was not a dignified worshiper. He started leaping and praising God, running through the temple. He was causing a scene at a religious service. How dare he? And he did such a good job of causing the scene. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them, to him. (coughs) (laughs) <laughs> and while the man clung to Peter and John, you would cling to them too if you just gotten ill from a malady that you had since birth. They were astonished and ran to them in the walkway called Solomon's common name. And when Peter saw this, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why are you surprised by this? Why do you stare at us, listen, as if by our own power or godliness, we have made this man walk. Peter say, we didn't have anything to do with it. It's Jesus. Peter, isn't that the one you denied? Oh, that's, that's ancient history, y'all. <laughs> you rejected the holy, righteous one and asked for a murder to be released to you. He wasn't finished. He's going to the sermon. In fact, it's cute in my editorial, in my Bible, since Peter's first sermon, Peter's second sermon. It's like, man, he's going off. You killed the prince of life, and God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has been made strong. It's Jesus' name, and the faith that comes through him that's given him this complete healing in your presence. 
Doesn't sound like he's denying the Lord anymore. And you'll say, well, David, he's not on trial. Hang on. Y'all know Acts. Acts chapter 4, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. This is when they took, uh, I've skipped ahead, this is when they took Peter, because he's the bold spokesman, and put him in the same spot that Jesus was, most scholars says, 40 days ago. So about a month and 10 days, he's standing where in front of these Caiaphas, all those people who put Jesus to death, But there's a difference in Peter now because back there, he didn't have the Spirit within him. But 40 days later, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the rulers and elders of the people, if we're being examined today about a kind service done to this lame man (coughs) to determine how he's healed, then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, I think he's kind of giving them a warning. I'm spreading this message. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. I, I could see Peter uh, pointing his finger. In that first sermon to the people at the temple, he said, you've killed the prince of life. Amazing statement. But God has raised him. Now he's standing before these authorities and he still had not backed down. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation exists in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It is not your law keeping. It is not your fancy prayers. It's not the tassels on your robe. It's not your religion. It's following and believing and trusting in Jesus whom you crucify. Now that's boldness. How did Peter get that bold when he was denying before a servant girl? I don't know. Because of the Holy Spirit. We are new covenant people. We live in that same reality. You see why I wanted to give this last Sunday? And why you've had to bear with me in my voice? Christ in us. The hope of glory. I can do all things. How? Through Christ who strengthens me. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. How? Through his spirit who dwells in you. I've made this point. I know y'all are tired of hearing about it, but you're going to hear about it more. All hell had concentrated. All the demons, the devil himself, everybody was summoned to keep Jesus in that grave and he was raised from the dead. So the same spirit, the same power of God that raised Jesus when all hell was against him. I know he's whispered to you, you're defeated, you can't beat this, you're always going to be this way. You tell him he's a liar. He's the father of lies. And remind him whose spirit you have in you. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I'm the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he will bear, he it is who will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you believe that last part that Jesus said? Apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to believe it. Whenever you think you're standing because you're such a great person and you have so much strength, 
Remember John 15, 5. I got to stay connected to the vine because the only place I find strength and life and nourishment is in the vine, Jesus Christ. <coughs> I, the eye didn't get on there. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. This is Paul writing. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So we've got Peter, you know, being bold as all get out. And now we've got Paul, and I want to just uh, quickly, I, I, I should have put both verses on there because this is powerful for you when you are dealing with um, things that happen in the world. I think this is supposed to be 2 Corinthians. Yeah. Uh, Paul said, we were pushed beyond our strength even to the point of death. And why are we this way? Why does God that he might rel not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Our reliance is on him. Of course, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove in the contrary. I worked harder than them all, though not I, but gr the grace of God within me. So finally, I get back to David Crowder. We are not alone. Hallelujah, right? We are not alone. Our God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. We can do all things. How? Through Christ who strengthens us. Through the indwelling spirit. Next time you get discouraged or the enemy has beaten you up, you remind him of Peter. And how many times the Lord has allowed you to say, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. How can we not love you? How can we not love you? You are the Lord of glory. You are the bright and morning star, the Alpha and Omega. You are the Lord of the universe. There is nothing too difficult for you. So yes, we love you because you first loved us, died for us while we were sinners, has given to us your precious spirit. That's the most precious thing we have in this life. That fellowship with you, that power that you have residing in us, Lord. So we pray, God, that like Peter, we will go forward in boldness because of you, because of the resurrection, because of the indwelling Spirit of God. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.